So I think our, our next speaker probably has one of everyone's favorite presentations of the day, or at very least, she has the most photos taken of her slides than just about anybody else at New Horizons. So please join me, before you get your phones out, please join me in welcoming Kristen Ingenito, CEO of MarketScope. Uh, just so you all know, it is my favorite picture of the day to see all your phones up and ready for my slides. So feel free. I'm not offended at all to have your phones up. Um, so thank you, Cynthia, for the warm introduction. And as always, the organizers, this is a fantastic meeting. And uh, you know, going off of the conversations that were had by our wonderful keynote speaker as well, this really is a, a unique community that you guys have very intentionally built. And I know that because we've had these conversations, but bringing forward the patient voices, hearing what's going on from the clinicians, from the innovators, from the strategics, from the scientists, you don't get that anywhere else. And it is so important as we go through and we look at the future of glaucoma care to have these conversations amongst everyone so that we can continue to develop at an even faster pace with more effectiveness. And in thinking of Bianca's future children, I mean, Really, could you guys put me on, like, not after the amazing patient talks? Like, it's having data after that? Ooh. So, okay. Go ahead and get your phones out. We'll jump into the pie charts, as riveting as they may be. <laughs> uh, while I'm probably the least qualified person in this room to talk about the future of glaucoma care, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, so, I always like to think about where we're starting from. So in 2024, MarketScope is valuing the global glaucoma market at $5.5 billion. These are manufacturer level revenues. And really what I'm looking at here is how those different segments are shifting within this revenue pie, if you will. Um, and what I'm seeing is that surgical devices is continuing to grow and being taking up more room in this space, which I think we all know to be true. This is gaining a little bit of popularity. There's a lot of new innovation happening in that market. And so we are seeing that reflected in the revenues that are happening. So the next thing I want to look at is the future. So this is based on our predictions and looking at 2024 through 2029. And I like to kind of pull in some context because with any sort of growth or even decline, heaven forbid, it all matters what else is going on in this space. So if you're declining by 1%, but everybody else is declining by 10%, hey, you're doing really good, congratulations. Uh, but thankfully, that's not the issue here, right? So we've got a lot of really healthy growth. We've got some segments moving around and some growing faster than others. And you see that canal surgery devices, that growth rate is coming down a little bit. It's been high, it's been really high for a couple of years now. Um, and that's, you know, as we kind of pull out from that initial launch from the new products hitting the market, you expect that growth rate to slow down a little bit. And then as that revenue piece, that base piece gets bigger, you expect the growth rate to go down. And that's why you're seeing some of these large segments like generic prostaglandins have that lower growth rate. It's because it's already coming from a pretty large piece of pie there. So this is a new slide, and so I'm gonna talk you through a little bit what I'm looking at here, because I had a hypothesis, and when I have a hypothesis, everybody watches out at work because I need all the data, and I want them to give it to me in different ways, and then I change everything they send me anyway. Uh, so this is just zooming in on the US market, and this is looking actually backwards rather than forwards, but I wanted to see if the prescription patterns, the how we are prescribing medication, how Andrew's prescribing medication, not me, uh, how that was changing. And so I looked at the units being prescribed and what I saw is that the number of units is going up overall. And that's great. But as I suspected, the, the shift here is really happening in that branded prostaglandin market where that share is going down. And you see that it's kind of leaning more into some of the newer compounds that are coming out, the uh, rho kinase inhibitors, the CAAs. And while you see the generic prostaglandins, it's going down a little bit, it's going down as a percent it's not going down as discrete units. So like there's actually more units going out there, it's just decreasing its share a little bit. So my hypothesis was correct and that is the best part about data when you get proven right. And then you can argue with me about it anyway because that's really fun and I enjoy that conversation. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, this one we talk about every year, but again, I wanted to look at this, and this reflects a lot of what Andrew was showing earlier in the Medicare data. The uh, surgical devices, the procedure trends, there's more procedures being done, and we've seen that growth over time, especially since COVID, and with all the new innovation coming to market. We have seen in the last 
hmm, probably 18 months in 2024 and like halfway through 2023, a little bit of flattening off in some of those spaces, especially canal-based and MIGS. And I think we all know what I'm gonna say next, and that is, why is that happening? Oh, our favorite conversation. Um, I think that what we're seeing is a little bit of impact from this continued reimbursement uncertainty that's happening. If you deal in finance, if you have retirement accounts, which hopefully we all do, um, you know that uncertainty is, everybody hates uncertainty in financial markets. It's no different here. So even though this is somewhat settled now and we've got some final rulings and stuff, we went ahead and asked the doctors, how is your kind of impression of this changed? Are you still concerned about reimbursement despite the fact that this has shifted? And what we found is that, yeah, there's still a lot of concern here. Now, there's a, a little piece of data that's actually not highlighted in this slide, but I'm, I really like those pieces of data sometimes. And that is that the surprising part to me here is that the percent of doctors who said that they were not at all concerned has actually gone down. So we have so few doctors that are like, eh, it'll be fine, even though the matter seems settled right now. So that is concerning to me, and I think that it tells me that as we're looking to the future, we really need to be considering the pathway to reimbursement and what that looks like and making sure that we have the right data prior to launch or soon after as we can so that there is that foundational evidence so that we don't have the uncertainty. But I also think that this is a success story of that same community that we talked about before and working together to inform the MAX and the insurance companies about how complex glaucoma treatment is. It's not cataract surgery. It's not 100% of patients are going to get cataract surgery and going to need it, and it's a binary kind of response. There's a, a tree of pathways that you can go to treat every patient, and I'm pretty sure most insurance companies are not going to understand that. <laughs> Um, my other constraint that I like to look at, and this has been talked about at Academy quite a bit, is uh, our demographics and our practices and the doctors. And so we wanted to dig in a little bit and we asked our doctors, when do you plan on retiring? And this was a little bit concerning to me. 16% uh, of our doctors were planning on retiring in the next three years. That's a material chunk. You know, it's, it's not doomsday, but I think that that is material. So we wanted to ask a little bit more, and we said, okay, so what's gonna happen to those patients? How are, are you recruiting new providers to your practice? And this kind of surprised me a little bit. We had 39% of our respondents say that it was extremely difficult to recruit new providers to their practice, both MD or OD. Now I wasn't anticipating this, and sometimes that happens with data, and I so badly wish I could go back and ask some more questions. <laughs> I want to know why. I want to know, is this because uh, there aren't enough? Is this because they want to start their own practices, or they want to stay in academia or research? Um, are they just you know, wanting a different kind of work-life balance? I, I don't know why this is, and I plan on asking, because I think that's really interesting. Um, but it does bring up some concerns in terms of the continuity here we go, I need coffee, uh, in terms of taking care of our patients long term and what that looks like, and especially as we serve some of these more rural communities where it's harder to just go find another doctor. So that takes me to, you know, what are solutions that are out there that we're working on? How do we get there? And of course, my favorite topic, what are we doing in digital AI? How can we help this situation? There's only so much we can do via telemedicine. Um, but there's a lot that we can look at. And this was uh, a pleasant surprise, and that was when we asked in uh, our diagnostic survey, which does cover MDs and ODs, and this is at the end of 2024, 7% of our respondents said that they're already using AI in their practice. Now, this may not mean that they're using it in terms of patient care, they might be using it in terms of billing, they might be using it in terms of marketing, but that alone was pretty exciting to me. And another 10% plan to use it in the next 12 months. So this is actually a really, a pretty big jump for me in terms of adoption of digital and especially of AI. And they reported the same things that we kind of think of as AI helping with. Office efficiency, uh, diagnosis and staging of patients, all of that sort of thing. So I think that we're on the right track with that. And that was, that was a little bit exciting for me. Um, and then, of course, uh, PACS, image management software, 
the percent of doctors that don't care about this is really minimal at this point. So this just goes to show that that digital technology is really integrated into diagnostics, and it's important to be thinking about it as we're designing products so that it's a real seamless process, and it works for our patients and our doctors. So I'm gonna pull out my crystal ball a little bit um, and you know, kind of go through this. My, we always look at this, right? So uh, we know glaucoma is affecting millions of people. That number isn't going down, it's going up, right? It's not shooting through the moon or anything, but we're not getting rid of this number, it's growing. We have a ton of research and money and investment and innovation coming to market in every capacity. We've got diagnostics that are working hard to be you know, everything that they can be for these patients. We have uh, sustained drug deliveries. We've got new lasers. We've got all sorts of things that are happening. So there's a ton of investment and there's a big growing market. And this is a great combination. On top of that, this is one of the best specialties in terms of adoption. Glaucoma doctors love innovation. They want to try it. If it's safe, if it's efficacious, they want to hear about it. They want to figure out how they can use that to better treat their patients, which is amazing combination right there. And the amount of data that collectively we have on glaucoma patients is massive. But that data is in all different formats. It's across platforms. It's across you know, modalities and countries. And that represents a real logistical problem. On top of that, I have to ask the question, are we even collecting the right data? And Dr. Siegfried kind of brought this up as we're looking at the effectiveness of different drugs and how it impacts different populations. If that data isn't in the diagnostic data that we're collecting, we don't have it. And you can't go back to those patients and get it. That represents a huge challenge. So we've got some complexity there. The treatment modalities are complex. You can't really get insurance companies on board when you're telling them, well, if it's this way, then I go here and then I go there. But we need reimbursement for our patients. They need to have access to care. So all of this has to work together. And this brings me to my word of the year and where I'm going to leave you today. And that is on this theme of community. This is a fantastic community. And if we bring together the patient voices and the brilliant minds, the innovators, and the strategics, and the scientists. And we talk about this. We talk about what data we need. What are you finding out? What are your hypotheses in research so that I can make sure that we're collecting that on the data side? What are you finding works? What are your ideas? Write your ideas down. Guys, this is, I can't say this enough. I don't care if they're good ideas or horrible ideas. Write them down. Leave them be. Let them breathe. Come back to it. Share them. Talk about them. Let's take some risks. Let's figure out how much better we can make this because I think the future of glaucoma care isn't me being an armchair quarterback up here and getting to comment on what all of you guys are doing. <laughs> I think it's out there. I think it's in your brains. And I'm really thankful for this community and you guys all putting it together. So thank you guys so much.